The Iberian Peninsula is one of the most fortunate slash unfortunate regions of the world geographically. Bordering the Mediterranean and the Atlantic makes it perhaps the best place on Earth to start a civilization of port cities and settlements, though at the same time, coupled with their vast mineral resources, it paints a massive target on their back. And believe me, there have been so many foreign invaders into Spain over the centuries that calling them the ancient world's town bike would be an insult to herpes-ridden seats everywhere. Still not as bad as Sicily, though. First the Celts moved in, then the Phoenicians, then the Greeks, then the Carthaginians, and of course the Roman Empire wanted a piece of that too, and by a piece I mean the whole damn peninsula. So, with this many cultures bullying the hell out of your native land, you'd think that any remnants of a uniquely Iberian culture would have been molded into a composite culture not unlike those found in the Orkney Islands or the Philippines. Well, yes and no. So, the southern cultures... Yeah, they got gangbanged to the point where you couldn't even show it on Pornhub. Vanilla as that site is anymore. But up to the north, it was a bit of a different story. The Basque Country, as it has come to be known today, was the only region of Iberia conscious enough to wear a condom during this cultural orgy. And by that, I mean they totally lucked out by developing a civilization behind a mountainous region way off to the northeast of the peninsula. That's not to say that these early peoples didn't get any of the cultural quirks imperialist conquerors had to offer them, as evidenced by their development of iron some 5,500 years ago, and their erroneous conflation with with the Vascones in the first century. However, the Basques speak a language which, for the most part, is unlike any other in the world today, with no Latin or even Aryan influences to speak of. In fact, modern-day Basques continue to espouse their political autonomy from Spain, and quite frankly, their cultures and customs are very differential from the rest of the nation, in ways which I, being a mythology channel, frankly don't give a shit about. I do, however, love me some dead religions, and trust me, the Basque mythology is quite dead. As while the rest of the aforementioned empires did a shit job mopping up the mess, Christianity, and especially the Spanish Inquisition, were extra tidy in trying to make Spain the most milk-toast white place on Earth not called Iceland. Yes, the Moors were primarily Berber. So right off the bat, what you need to understand about the Basques is that, quite contrary to pretty much all of Europe, they did not press the importance of the sky very much. You can thank the continental Celts and their lack of ambition for that one. Instead, the pantheon of the ancient Basques was very Thonian, and almost stereotypically female, as the only male deity of any note is only famous because he's the husband of another female deity whom they do not shy away from the fertility imagery with. Which means that in all likelihood, the Basque mythology is very, very old, almost certainly coming from the Neolithic period and could potentially predate that era by millennia. However, this is a bit hard to tell, as given their relative isolationism from other Mediterranean and European cultures, there appears to be little to no religious evolution up until some strange men in red robes dressed like Alucard came into town, told the people that their nature goddess was really Mother Mary, and they absolutely needed to dunk their babies' heads underwater because their sky daddy told them to. Speaking of that goddess, their chieftain deity was a little lady by the name of Mari, making it rather easy for Christian missionaries to compare her to Mary. She's the goddess we know the most about, and even that isn't saying much. Mari's name is thought to be a derivative of the Basque word for mother, a Mari, though she goes by two other titles, Anbotoko Mari, Lady of Mount Anboto, or Murumendiko Dama, Lady of Mount Murumendi. It kind of depends on who you ask and where in the Basque Country you are as to where Mari's exact dwelling is. Mari is thought to be an extension of Amalura, or the Earth Mother, which of course is just the Earth, and is probably the closest thing we're ever going to get in terms of a Mother Nature figure. That's pretty much what she is. A divine being who crosses through the sky in various different forms, and depending on which cave on which mountain she's coming or going from, directly controls the weather, though some regional myths equate these natural phenomena with her children, and looks after the living creatures on her abode, meaning that she is a fertility goddess in both the agricultural sense, but also in the being a coach to the sperm swim team sense. 
Mari is thought to have several different caves in various mountain regions where she is known to migrate to on occasion. The catalyst for this shift in weather patterns is the fact that Mari utilizes the sky as more or less an autobahn or a place where she can fast travel from cave to cave, mountain to mountain, auspiciously shaped rock formations to objectively phallic shaped rock formations, which is a common reoccurring theme among the Basque gods and goddesses. It's important to note that while the sky does have significance for both Mari and the embodiments of the sun and the moon, who we are about to get to here in just a moment, it is not deified, debatably, by the Basque people and serves as another antithetical foil to the Aryan-inspired religions of the time, who not only worshipped the sky deity, but was seen as a supreme, divine, paternal figure to the rest of the pantheon to which they belong, oftentimes at the expense of vilifying their more thonic, earthly deities. Speaking of, you may not consider the sun to be an earthbound spirit, however the Basques believe that their sun goddess Iguzki Amandrea slept half the day underground until rising up over the mountains in the morning. And much like other solar deities, her rise into the daytime sky was meant to be indicative of neutralizing the evil spirits, called Lamiak, which scurried across the Basque countryside at night, kidnapping unsupervised children. They used to take even the good boys and girls who were in bed on time because, for the first time ever, these evil spirits learned how to actually operate a doorknob, and thus were able to do as they pleased, up until the Basques realized that they had a natural aversion to the Eguzkilor, the Basque sunflower. And so these helpless plants were snipped off their stems and nailed to people's doorways. Supposedly, the petals looking like sun rays are enough to frighten the Lamiak away. Though I'd like to think that eventually they'd wise up to these shenanigans as well and figure out it's just a dead plant and go back to their Iberian home invasions. Apparently though, this herbal remedy wasn't enough as it implied that you actually had a front door to defend yourself with. So Amalura was forced to create a new daughter to watch over humanity from above as her sister slept. This light, while not quite as powerful a repellent against the witches and evil spirits of the time for its inexplicable propensity for turning itself off at least once a month, is much cooler in my opinion, as the natural resource which the Ilargi Amandrea uses to illuminate the night sky is human souls, thus granting her the title of Ilargi, which means Light of the Dead. Which means that yes, the moon, according to the ancient Basques, who canonically recognize the face on the moon, is made up of a bunch of consolidated human consciousness, unified by the Great Equalizer, which then hovers ominously over their living descendants, knowing they soon will be annexed into their composite form. Which is just some Evangelion shit, and I love it. And while he isn't confirmed to exist, and even if he did, this deity would be a later addition to the Pantheon via the Aryan migrations, it does bear mentioning that Ortizi is the name of the firmament which laid above the clouds who does absolutely nothing except get stepped on by the strong empowered female celestial deities who don't need no man. Excusing the fact that half of them is comprised of men, and the other one, genetically speaking, is half of their father's nut. So, yeah, do with that information what you will. Which is my seamless transition into talking about our first real male god in the Basque pantheon, a snake deity named Sugar. Now, several different groups of Basques see Sugar in several different ways. He is either the husband of Mari, who as previously attested is often conflated with Amalura, thus making him the father of Ilargi and Eguzkilor. However, in other regions, he's just a dickhead snake who will vaporize your children if they misbehave. The Basques oftentimes equated Sugar to bolts of lightning streaking across the sky. You know, because snakes and lightning both squiggle. Oftentimes accompanying Sugar is his professed son, Hodi, the spirit of the clouds who also likes to hurl rain and lightning down on the unsuspecting peons below, but apparently you can appease him by falling on your knees in prayer and offering him burnt laurel leaves, which I would caution anyone watching this video is going to work out about as well for you as those idiots who tried shooting a hurricane a few years back. In contrast to Hodi is Basawan, the spirit of the woodlands and protector of flocks, Whenever the storm god is about to get up to his old tricks, Basa Wan lets out a guttural ah! roar, sometimes assumed to be the sound of thunder, warning farmers to gather up their flocks and stow them away until the storm passes. 
Basa Wan is described as physically the strongest of the Basque gods, with long red locks of hair and an accompanying beard which covers his massive, hulking body as well as a multitude of scars all over himself. I'm sorry, it's very sexual. Most notably, he is missing a left foot, which is presumably lost in pursuit of his habit of fighting entire packs of wolves at once like he's Liam Neeson. Wait a second. Fighting wolves? Missing foot? BSMPD magical shoot? Holy shit, this guy killed Fenrir! Well, apparently, some of the Basque country aren't as appreciative of Basa Wan's contribution to society as evidenced by the existence of the Gizozo, the Basque variation of the werewolf, which are born by, you guessed it, people putting their junk into wild animals. As the Minotaur Nephilim and Genghis Khan taught us nothing of the dangers of mythological crossbreeding, you furry heretics, you shall all burn for damning us all! Anyway, another m famous mythical creature from the Basque Country, born from far less... Uh, yiffing tendencies, is the Zizengori, a giant fire-breathing bull living in the caves of various different mountains, who some local teenagers like to play chicken with, only to realize the next day that Zizengori can take on a human form and come down from the mountainside to kick ass and chew bubblegum. And bubblegum hasn't been invented yet. One professed origin story for this monstrous creature is that in life he was a thief who stowed away his reserves of gold in a cave he lived out of. One day he decided to go into foreign lands to seek even greater treasures, but was caught and then put to death. The foreigners then got the bright idea to head back into the countryside and try to find where the thief had hidden his treasure, only to discover that he had reincarnated himself as a giant raging bull who incinerated all who tried to steal his property. And hence is the story of why flamethrowers are not only legal, but considered a sensible means of self-defense in the Basque. That is a joke, don't actually try it. Spain is infamously tough on guns, even by European standards. Now, there are a couple of other deities I didn't cover today, such as the personification of death, Herio, and a couple of mythical creatures such as the Gautzagori, little pixie fuckers who wear red pants, live in a wooden box, and voluntarily surrender themselves to a life of slavery to whoever opens said box. But now I have. Thank you to everyone for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed our brief overview of the Basque mythology and their beliefs. If you like what you saw here today and would like to continue supporting the channel, well, I mean the subscribe button is right down there, dude. I don't know what else to tell you. I also have a Patreon link down below, so if you'd like to make the irresponsible financial choice of giving a stranger over the internet money so that he can make more funny videos about people's dead religions, I ain't gonna stop you. In fact, I'll even provide the link to that page and my Streamlabs if you don't feel like committing to recurring payments. If you have a request as to which mythology I should cover next on my channel, be sure to leave it in the comments section below. Either that, or just tell me that you're one of the three or four people from the Basque Country who have internet access and now hate my guts for some reason. They always come out of the woodwork on these types of videos. Regardless, ladies and gentlemen of the internet, I still appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time out of your day to watch my videos. My name is Messiah as a Mythology, and I hope you all have a God's blessed day.